Hello and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast. This podcast is hosted by the Chair of Circular Economy and Urban Metabolism held by Aristide Tenasiadis and Stefan Kamperman at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. In this podcast, we talk with researchers, policymakers and different practitioners to unravel the complex aspects of what makes urban metabolism and economies more circular. Bonjour et bienvenue au podcast Circular Métabolisme. Ce podcast est produit par la chaire en économie circulaire et métabolisme urbain de l'Université Libre de Bruxelles, qui est tenue par Aristide Athanasiadis et Stephen Kempelman. Dans ce podcast, nous discutons avec des chercheurs, des administrations et des praticiens pour éclaircir les différents aspects qui rendent l'économie et le métabolisme de nos villes plus circulaires. On episode number eight of the Circular Metabolism podcast, we had the chance to chat with Julia Vol, previously Governments and Cities Network Manager at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I was particularly interested to discuss with Julia to better understand how the Ellen MacArthur Foundation managed to create such a momentum around circular economy in such a short notice. Indeed, as a researcher on this topic for quite some time, I've, I have always wondered why this expression became so popular compared to the green economy, the blue economy or resiliency for instance, and what were the arguments that convinced this vast array of stakeholders ranging from very large companies to governments and to startups. According to Julia, circular economy took off so quickly because unlike other sustainability agendas and plans, it was an economic agenda that is focusing on innovation, business development, job creation, and which made sense to most businesses. On top of that, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation managed to be at the right place at the right time to capitalize on existing initiatives from sustainability to corporate so social responsibility, but make them much more operational. While I could understand why the private sector would be motivated to include circular economy principles in their business models, It was still hard to understand why local, regional and national governments were also interested in this concept. Julia mentions that they also see an economic, the economic benefits of circular economy. But governments and administrations also fa face new sets of systemic challenges which were less present 10 to 20 years ago. In that sense, they need to reinvent themselves, create new types of growth, take care of job creation, but also, most importantly, face their materiality. With uh, recent events like the China ban, cities become suddenly aware of their need to take care of their used materials. Yet, how do we make a city more circular, which doesn't necessarily own all of the infrastructures and economic sectors need to uh, needed to deploy circular economy strategies? For Julia, at the city scale, we could do so if we focus on the circular economy from a design perspective. So, so not only how to recycle more, but how do we engage with businesses that provide the services that are used in cities, such as mobility, food, etc. By engaging with daily users, and given that it is a densely populated area over a limited territory, cities can become a hotbed for design, material and business model innovations. So far, Julia has identified two approaches to facilitate and accelerate the uptake of circular economy in cities. First, cities like Amsterdam, Brussels and Charlotte, for instance, develop an urban metabolism study to have a better knowledge on the flows entering and exiting the city in order to identify the priority sectors upon which to focus. The second approach, used by cities like London, Phoenix and Toronto, is to identify the existing biggest players that could have an impact on the circular economy and try working with them to have a higher impact. In addition, the city has a role to recognize the most promising ventures in their context and to provide funding and infrastructures to help them grow. This is where bigger companies can also come into play as they can make a pilot in one city and then scale up in more cities. In such a complex system, to scale up the circular economy you need a resilient ecosystem of diverse actors. 
This means on the one hand smaller and on-the-ground actors to cater for context-specific aspects of different cities and users, and on the other hand bigger ones that can generalize solutions across the globe. Finally, based on the real hype around circular economy in the last decade, I wanted to ask Julia, how can we prevent circular washing, or in other words, the abuse of this expression for just minimal or uh, artificial initiatives without really changing their, cause, uh, their core business models. For Julia, if companies are doing so, they're just missing out business development and revenue opportunities, which will hurt them on the long run. Enjoy this episode and don't forget to visit our website www.circularmetabolism.com for the rest of our productions. Before you go, please help us improve our podcast by subscribing to your favorite app, including YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher, and leave us a comment with your thoughts. Hi, Julia. Uh, it's great to meet you finally uh, here in Brussels at the Circular Economy Day, uh, which a lot of presentations were coming through. And I don't know if you were in the morning with the uh, visits as well of some of the... Unfortunately, I had to miss that. Yeah. Um, well, there are a number of bubbling uh, initiatives here in Brussels, and uh, it's great to also have a, a hear of what's happening worldwide, because I guess Ellen MacArthur Foundation is perhaps the, the go-to uh, foundation when we talk about circular economy, and you probably have a, a good idea of what happens around the world, and especially in the, in the realms of cities. So I, I'd like, first of all, to, to have an idea of you know, we had this discussion uh, beforehand. Why do you think circular economy is so popular nowadays? Or what made it uh, to become this um, expression that governments use, that companies use, that researchers use so frequently? Um, thank you, first of all, for having me over. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in Copenhagen and seeing the great event that um, was organized by the, by the region uh, and see all the amazing initiatives going on in Brussels. I think it's uh, definitely one of the most pioneering cities and regions we're working with uh, and it's quite impressive to see the momentum and so many things are happening, so much building in the city. Uh, so really looking forward for the next couple of days to learn more about it. Um, regarding your question, I think that the circle economy has it, it became so popular and really took off because as opposed to many of the other sustainability agendas, this is not a sustainability agenda. This is an economic agenda uh, that is driving innovation, business development, job creation, a lot of the things that are so important for us today and it just makes sense to people. It is very clear rationale that connects the environmental aspects of things, the economic aspect of things and the social aspect of things into a quite systemic approach and people can resonate and see okay this is makes sense I can see how it can create new revenue streams how it can help me develop new business models improve the livability of people in my city so I think this is really not being a, a green agenda but really an innovation agenda that's where it landed well and we are really happy to see that it's been picked up uh, so fast even yeah one might say uh, I think we started about eight years ago and suddenly there is a circular economy package by the commission there's lots of things happening on the corporates in, in cities so yeah it's quite tremendous to see and so what's exactly the I, I really liked and enjoyed what you say the systemic approach and I think a lot of times the systemic approach lacks from these green uh, deals or from you know these economy plans uh, it's one or the other now mm. you try to combine both um, and so I think you're right the word economy really helps in this uh, agenda in mm. this discussion now why Ellen MacArthur Foundation why how did you manage to bring people together and uh, what was this reason of success do you have any hints well, I think there are a couple of factors in play. Uh, I think, first of all, there, there is something around being in the right time, in the right place, perhaps. Uh, there has been no, 
it's a stability talk has been evolving for the past few decades and I think at, at probably at the turn of the century and, and in the early 2000s it was CSR was driving the agenda yeah. but I think it became quite evident to many especially businesses that CSR and all of these sustainability initiatives they are very incremental mm -hmm. they require a lot of investments and they are peripheral to, peripheral to the business model and it's absolutely not very clear how it helps you to generate new revenues so I think that being sort of the market it became more and more ready for something different and the fact that the people that were founding the El Macario Foundation have managed to bring a couple of school of thoughts like biomimicry and cradle to cradle and industrial symbiosis and combine them in a way that was easy to visualize mm -hmm. and has made clear economic rationale behind it that's why companies jumped on it. And I think that the couple of first reports came in 2012, 13, really outlined the economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that would help to get the first movers, the first pioneers on board. And once they jumped on board, then, you know, everybody want to be, <laughs> jump of, on a successful of wagon. <laughs> of course, when yeah. you hear big companies such as Philips, such as, you know, the, the, the biggest ones, where the, the first Renault and all of the, you know, yeah. the, the big six, or I don't know how you call them, the, the first ones who jumped in the wagon, you're already impressed because, mm. you know, it's not that easy to, to put these, well, in a relatively new uh, concept to, to bring them on board. Well, I guess Philips already had some, you know, on the ground and practice. I don't remember when the pay for lux was already installed. Was it just... I think it was around the same time. It yeah. was when they started experimenting with that and... So, so they were already, let's say, doing what they, you know, what mm. they, they felt was important. But um, so companies is, is, let's say, the biggest component, I think, why circular economy is now thriving. Now there are also cities and regions and governments that are behind it. Why mm. do you think they are so interested? They also see it from an economic point of view. They see it. Uh, what's their rationale, do you think? I think they, they are seeing a lot of the economic aspects in that, but I think also right now, s government, either it's local, regional, national, they are faced with really new sets of challenge that mm. were maybe less relevant 10, tw 20 years ago. They need to, to reinvent themselves, they need to create new types of growth, they need to address the job, cr job situation, uh, also the the question of materials is becoming more and more evident. On the one hand, materials are becoming more scarce and uh, volatile. On the other hand, we end up with abundance of, re of used materials in cities and regions and uh, legislation like, like the China ban. Like now, now, yeah. it's, now yeah. cities are like, what am I going to do with all this plastic? But I think they are being pushed into looking into new ways of doing things and really getting some of the pioneering governments on board mm -hmm. the city of london the the danish uh, the danish government slovenian it was really helping us to demonstrate okay there is space for that and when we worked together with the danish government of on the toolkit for policy makers mm -hmm. it was really helping us outline the economic opportunities for sectors and countries so now we can say yeah. If you if you if you are a food producing country, this is the set of opportunities you're looking into. If you focus and and what country or region are building build construction, this is your set of opportunities. So it really helped to demonstrate there is concrete things that policymakers care about mm -hmm. and need to have in order to be voted in again. So the, here it is. And um, so, of course, nations are slightly easier than cities because at least they have you know the entire economic sector or represented and they have you know some um, infrastructure already there in cities you know it's a bit more difficult because sometimes the infrastructure the, the waste management or the uh, reuse or the recycling plants are not necessarily within the city boundaries and sometimes you like brussels it's a very much a service-based economy mm. and th that's i find that slightly more challenging i guess than nations. How do we make a city more circular or what's the approach when we're talking about cities? 
Well, I'm not necessarily sure that it's easier for national governments huh? because national governments are much more slow mm. and they, everything that has to go through legislation is always happening quite being quite challenging again there is like for example that's why circular economy took off uh, faster in for example Denmark or Slovenia because they're small countries okay you compare that to to UK and it's I mean the, all of Denmark is smaller than the London population yeah so yes they have more control okay. over some of the sectors but I think if you approach if you look at the circular economy from a design perspective and not thinking oh we just need to recycle more but how do we engage the businesses that are providing some of the services and products that people consume in cities, whether it's mobility or building houses or the clothing that we wear, and thinking, okay, on a city level, how can we create a circular economy that is engaging the users, the daily users? How do we develop new business models mm -hmm. that leverage on the fact that it's dense population over small geographical area and is rich in people and data yeah. and how do we engage all these um, advantages of the city to try and have be a hotbed for innovation both design innovation material innovation and business model innovation then cities have advantage you can pilot some new mobility service on a brussels sure. level and it's quite easy right sure sure same about we work with uh, retailers who are now going to start piloting new leasing um, business models in, uh, in in cities around the world mm -hmm. and they they are leveraging on the fact that it's a lot of young people living in cities they're open for innovation they all have iPhones it's easy to access them and try new things with them and so I think it's a great point so the size might matter therefore um, I'm wondering, have you, from a city to another, have you seen any patterns? Are each city completely different in the way they uptake circular economy? I mean, you, you mentioned London, uh, let's say London and Brussels. Do they have, so I guess the economic sectors are frequently similar, like the construction sector, the food sector, let's say the retail sector. Mm -hmm. But except from that, is there any, the implementation, is it similar or, you know, they're very much context-based factors that differentiate the uptake of circular economy in London and in Brussels? Um, I think that there are probably two schools of approach. One is done, for example, by Amsterdam and mm -hmm. Brussels, Charlotte, North Carolina. We start working closely with them. And what they did... I saw their report uh, yeah. a couple of days ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What they've done uh, was very similar to what happened in Brussels. They did uh, urban metabolism approach. Yeah. They said, okay, we have X, X amount of materials that are going to waste from built environment and from textiles. And we, this is like for us the highest priorities on the, on the agenda right now because that's where we have the biggest impact potential. Mm -hmm. And they build their circular economy and you guys are building circular economy approach around the, the, met the urban metabolism outputs. Mm -hmm. And then there is uh, cities like London and probably Phoenix, Toronto, that are more looking into, okay, we, we understand the economy, we know who is here and is willing to work on it. Mm -hmm. Let's see who are the biggest sort of impactors in the field that are present in the city and try to build our circular economy approach around working with them. Mm. So what exists already? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, for a city like London, it's easy because well, they have everything out of everything, <laughs> right? Uh, but for for uh, for uh, Phoenix, for example, uh -huh. they leveraged on a very strong university present in the city. Okay. And the ASU, which is the I ASU, think the yeah. one of the largest universities in the, in North America, and they have a very advanced uh, innovation approach. So they built a circular economy hub around the university right. and the landfill, and say, okay, if we divert materials from landfill, and it is, it is end of end of pipe approach, but I think that's that is where you need to be flexible, where you need to start somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and right now they manage they they already probably exceeding the rate of their plans to divert waste from landfill. Yeah. 
creating new jobs in the city, creating new business models, and by that also creating proof of concept, and then gives them more leverage leverage yeah. to continue on. Okay, and how do you think then you you figure out who are these people or who are these initiators? Is it just you know personal context, uh, context? Sorry, or is it uh, we know who has the biggest number of employees, and we we say okay, perhaps these uh, this um, company might be the first one to to, ta to to start with, or or you mentioned the university in the case of uh, ASU. Is it just a tacit uh, you know uh, knowledge, and they, they start from it? Well, that's where the that's why also I guess where city has an advantage because we are not the ones to decide for them like what should be yeah. their circuit economy approach. It's because the people who work in the city they and it, they're closer to the action, the daily action. It's easier for them to recognize. Okay, we think that we need to go on one, two, three, and from our perspective, we're happy to support whatever they think is the right approach. But that's also where versus national government that is sort of very much detached from what's happening on yeah. a daily basis, which are the, of course they know the sectors, but like who are the shakers and, 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 and movers around. Yeah. And I think that's where cities have advantage on that. Uh, another thing that I th we, we started mentioning here with the evaluation of the chair, one of our key feelings that cities should move forward is that Once you have these shakers and innovators and front runners, how do we make sure that they kind of anchor themselves? And you know, it's not just an innovation for a couple of years, but we manage to, you know, upscale their ambitions and uh, make them at a city level. Because right now, a lot of times, it's uh, one company with one flow at uh, one location, and if they don't have enough funding, you know, they they die off and the idea dies off. How can we make it more? sustainable I know the, the word is a it's not the one that, that you use but how do we make them to stay here and to thrive you know how do we upscale the ambitions so I guess that's where the that's where the um, city has a role in say in recognizing the most promising ventures in the in the city and either provide make sure that well they are successful first of all of course but then provide funding and infrastructure to, hmm. to scale or that's where a bigger business can come into play and say well this company has a very good idea and we think it could be relevant for us mm -hmm. we're gonna pilot on the city level and if it's successful we're gonna scale up uh, mm -hmm. just one example from the C100 stories and it is not a city level but it's a story that I think it's it's a fantastic story that I, I love using is that uh, through the C100, we had an emerging innovator from Netherlands called mm -hmm. Ecor, and they, through the C100, they met uh, Heineken, Mexico. And as conversations happening, when, when you know, when you put <laughs> good people together around the table, uh, they realized that they can uh, substitute a lot of the packaging material from byproducts of uh, the brewing process. Mm -hmm. And they piloted this specific project in one brewery in Mexico, and it has become so successful that now Heineken is scaling it worldwide. This company, Ecor, would not have a problem anymore of like surviving on on that because because it was good approach and it yeah. was economically viable and it it it, it got picked up. And uh, so I think, of course, it has any venture in order to be sustainable for long term has to be economically viable yeah and if so by either the city giving the support or bigger businesses picking it up then and do you, do you have this because that's a, a nice collaboration between big and small right but um is this the way to go forward or you know is it the small initiatives that are gonna um, rule or is it you know, the big ones that are gonna change the, the system do, do you do you think that there is one or the other or do they have to work together or how does it work who's gonna change the economy is it the, the small players or the big players or or something in between well I think it's it has to be everyone <laughs> uh, I think that I mean if you look at the natural world in order to be resilient you have to have biodiversity yeah. you have elephants and you have flies right yeah. and if one of them is gone then the other one will, will be gone as well 
I think that this coexistence is an equilibrium between yeah. big and small is, will have to continue to exist, probably even more than now. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it's both. No, it's, I'm asking this because there is always a, a kind of a different approach between a big one and a small one. So the small one is always, so it's very innovative and it's also very labor intensive, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, the big one is much more efficient and you know the, the economy of scale is what matters and what changes a lot of the economy right so it's it's always this back and forth and I, I'm not sure you know what types of circular economy do we have it's probably not there's not just one circular economy I guess there you know there's a labor intensive or a social economy or an innovative economy or an efficient economy and I think these are kind of different pathways and I don't know if uh, you if you've seen different pathways appear or do you see a more of a homogeneous story out there? Well, I think what we see is really a mix. And I think that in order for the circle economy to scale, you definitely have to have the big businesses picking it up. But then in order for it to be scaled out on a practical way, mm -hmm. in, a, in a, okay, well, let's say, you have a phone at Samsung. Let's say tomorrow Samsung decides that all their uh, phones are circular, they are repairable, they have collection systems across the world. Samsung alone cannot do that. So what we're going to do is partner up with uh, small scale repair shops, logistics, uh, reverse yeah. logistics, uh, maintenance companies, retailers perhaps that are going to be servicing your particular phone in Brussels mm -hmm. and there's going to be another set of suppliers and vendors that are going to be doing the same in Copenhagen and so on. So you have of course the, the giants yep. but they will not be able to serve all of their needs by themselves and that's where they need the, the, the diversity of the small businesses. Right, let's I want to, to wrap it up perhaps with a more critical question and we kind of discussed it before is you know, sustainable development is now dying off as an expression and because it was used and abused. And I, I'm always afraid that people are going to do the same thing with circular economy or they're going to use it in their own kind of manner for their own um, ambitions or their own interests. Do, do you, how do we keep, how do we make sure that this does not happen? How do we make sure it's not a new type of, let's say, greenwashing? How do we ensure that it's real change? How would you greenwash with a circle economy? No, is well greenwashing a lot. The, the CSR, for instance, mm -hmm. a lot of big companies said they were doing CSR, but at the end of the day, the, they didn't change much in their behavior. They they had a sustainability officer, and they said we were now buying, let's say, reusable cups instead of um, plastic cups. But at the end of the day, their their entire business model didn't change. But I think that's exactly why CSR has failed. Mm -hmm. Is because well, for circular economy, you cannot get a stamp or you know yeah 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 a report from yeah. GRI PRI. Uh, there is no. You can say that you're doing circular economy, but if you're not doing circular economy, it's you're only hurting yourself. Yeah. So you can say, oh, we recycle. Yeah. And that's your circular economy, but then. You're not. You're gonna miss out on so many of the business development and revenue opportunities. Yeah. That that's okay. You don't have to do it. Somebody else will. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, is if there's money yeah. on the table, it will always be picked up. Yeah. And if you come, if a company says that they're doing circular economy, but they don't really embed it within their business model, then they're just gonna miss out. And I think that's just the way you know, evolutionary processes will uh, suss out those who are actually doing it and committing to it and those who don't. So hopefully, you know, the, reg the material criticality and this volatility of price will make anyhow everyone circular. That's that's how we hope that things will work out, I guess. Yeah, and, and regulation and the consumption and user patterns. I mean, look at what happens with business models that are making sense for consumers. Nobody is regulating the way to use Airbnbs and Ubers rather yeah. than uh, 
breaking your taxes, but this is the most viable option for consumers, so they use it. Yeah. And the same over time is going to happen with other circular economy business models. Not that Uber is a circular economy business model. No, no, <laughs> Don't yeah, quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting one, for sure. Mm. Uh, and it's difficult to see how exactly these innovation have, you know, infiltrate into the regulatory s state or the, the regulatory system. Because, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.